start the Lending Machine Seminar Series this year. Um, and thanks for Bloomberg for uh, sponsoring this, and we are very excited to start this year with, uh, no, uh, with a professor at the University of Washington and a research manager at uh, Alex Institute for Artificial Intelligence, uh, also known as AI2. Uh, Noah uh, published extensively in NLP and has a lot of uh, impact in the field. He wrote the book on structure prediction and uh, really pioneered uh, the, the work in the intersection of uh, political science and NLP. It's kind of like we taking off and had life with on with online conferences and uh, many works that have been going on. Uh, something that really makes uh, Noah stand up is that he's really the market. At uh, creating uh, amazing NLP research, uh, that each of them stands on their own with like with very unique and well-defined contributions, and these are all, it's all based on like research that they started uh, doing with uh, Noah and in his lab. And this includes uh, I think seven faculty right now, something like that, uh, that are placed at uh, top universities, and uh, several. Uh, so thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, hello, Ithaca. Uh, I haven't I haven't been up there in a while. I see Lillian, other friendly faces. Um, I, I haven't been to Cornell Tech before, so uh, I haven't been to Roosevelt Island. I don't think so. Uh, thanks for having me. This is this is exciting. You have a really cool campus. Um, Today, I am going to be talking about work that was done jointly uh, at UW and AI2. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'm going to start out by going uh, back to uh, the roots of the field uh, and, and say a little bit about history. Um, because I, I realize increasingly when I go to give these talks, I remember things that not everybody else remembers. Um, so when NLP, when I sort of entered NLP, we were in a transition phase between uh, the, the sort of first era, uh, we could say, and this probably subdivides in, in a more fine-grained way that, that people with even more gray hair than me will remember. Uh, but, but to a first approximation, what was going on back in the 80s and before was that natural language processing was accomplished by uh, the construction of rule-based systems that use things like lexicons and maybe regular expression pattern matching. And the big, I would say the big driving application that, that was sort of a success story back at that time um, that, that, that got a lot of focus and that, that was at least most remembered when I entered the field was information extraction. And what was happening as I came into the field was we were, we were moving towards something new. But, but what we were maybe giving up, and I think some people back then were a little bit unhappy about, was a notion that the, the, the models were interpretable you could understand what, uh, and maybe even prove some things theoretically about what your systems were doing. We had a whole uh, deep understanding of what finite state machines could do and what other formalisms maybe could or couldn't do. And what we were moving toward in, in the 90s and, and into the, the 2000s was uh, using data. And that was a great idea. So, so basically, if you looked at what NLP was doing at, at that time, uh, we were building probabilistic and statistical models that were, that were still based on the same kinds of features and representations that came out of that first phase, but now we were using data. And this was an era when new applications like sentiment analysis were really taking off, including seminal work done at Cornell, uh, and machine translation started getting really good because we realized that we had data from which we could learn to do these tasks better than human engineers could write the rules. And this is, this is kind of old news. And I, I don't know, people, people may not remember, but it was, it, was mi it was sort of a mixed bag in terms of how well we could understand what the models were doing. So if you have a linear model, you can kind of understand what, what the different factors are in its performance, and you can kind of understand why a decision is made, but you have to interpret everything with some caution. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot of caveats, and the guarantees were starting to get uh, maybe less strong, and if you didn't really understand optimization, um, it, it, I don't know, it was, it was sort of mixed, but n now, it's, now it's even worse. So in the past decade, what we've been moving toward is this new world of neural NLP where everything is based on uh, continuous representations and vector and matrix functions and lots of nonlinearities, and nobody understands anything about what the models are doing. They may tell you that they do, but don't trust them. Uh, and and guarantee, we have no guarantees about anything. So, um, so this is an uncomfortable <laughs> world. Uh, and I think uh, discomfort is often a good source of research ideas. Um, so what I'm going to present today is some work that's been done uh, by my collaborators and myself. Uh, the first thing will be a new neural network that is interpretable by design. 
that's inspired by things that worked well back in the old rule-based times. And it's, it's called SOPA, which stands for soft patterns. Uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to understand, so that won't take too much time. Um, and then I'm going to step back and, and talk a little bit about uh, an abstraction that, that SOPA helped us uh, recognize called rational recurrences, which is a restricted class of recurrent neural networks with particular properties. Uh, and so I'll, I'll explain rational recurrences and some surprises about rational recurrences and some open questions and some experiments. And then finally, I'll present some new work that's going to appear at EMNLP in a couple of months uh, on improving the, the compactness of rational recurrences uh, using, using an old technique from, uh, from linear times called sparse regularization. And then I'll, I'll make a few uh, uh, grandiose parting shots and we can open it up for questions and discussion. So um, patterns have been an important idea in many areas of NLP for many years. Um, in the early times, they were, they were handwritten. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give examples in a minute, but, um, but uh, over time, you know, people, it's, it's maybe, maybe not the most popular thing to think about, but people have introduced methods for uh, doing machine learning in a symbolic way to, to recover patterns that are easy to understand. Um, in this talk, I'm mostly going to be talking about text classification problems like sentiment analysis. So here are examples of the kind of inputs that our system uh, might need to look at. And the, the idea would be we want to judge whether this is a, a positive review of a film uh, or a negative one. And you can, you can, you know, if, if you want to think about what a neural net might have to do or what, a, what a, an NLP system might have to do to, to make that classification decision, you might start fixating on patterns like this repeated good good, good, good thing, you know, all these good things, that's a pattern. Um, now, it's a pattern that may, you know, maybe the pattern is fairly abstract and it doesn't care what comes after good. It's just the fact that you said good so many times. It's like a really strong signal, right? And, and maybe, um, I don't know, the last one doesn't feel like it's got a lot of great patterns uh, because it's, a, it's like kind of a pun. I think the name of the movie was 50 ways to leave, 51 Ways to Leave or something like that. Was that a film? Misguided comedy. Misguided comedy. I don't know. Anyway, um, so, so um, here's, a, here's maybe a, a more interesting example. This is actually a pattern that our, uh, our model learned on one of the data sets. Um, and I've written it as a finite state machine because that's a really uh, a nice kind of computational framework for writing down uh, patterns. So, um, so what you have here is you start off with a word that's sort of, I don't know, positive um, and, uh, and maybe kind of, um, these, are, these are words that are, that are probably, I don't know, some of these might be like GRE words, right? <laughs> these are, this is like kind of high upper, upper, upper class speak. But like, and then you use the word portrait and it has to be portrait. So if you say like positive word portrait of and then a determiner, this is like a really good pattern for detecting that they like the movie. Okay, model learned this. Um, and so what you have when you, when you write it as a finite state machine, you're, you have this self loop at the beginning that says anything can come before, I don't care. Anything can come after, I don't care. I have to get this whole sequence. I have a lot of choices for that first adjective, but I don't have a lot of choices for these words in the middle. And this one is really expected to be like a determiner. Like there's going to be some noun that comes after this. Interestingly, it doesn't care what the portrait is of. Right? It's just, you, you said positive word portrait and that's a good sign. So this is like, this is probably not a pattern I would have thought of, uh, but it, it turns out this is useful, a, a useful and predictive pattern that we can all understand. Um, so I don't know, this is something you might have seen, um, uh, maybe not this particular pattern, but something like this might have occurred uh, 20 plus years ago. Um, for for uh, an NLP system. And then when people started uh, using data, one of the things that they found really convenient was to start adding weights. So instead of just matching the words, you're also going to calculate uh, a score as you're doing the match. And so different words might match with different <coughs> strengths. So mesmerizing is really good, self-assured, not quite as good a match. And what you're doing is as you're traversing through the states in this finite state machine, you're multiplying together the weights. And that gives you a score of how well this pattern matches a piece of text that you fit as, as input. And there's a, there's a few quibbles here, like what if there's more than one path that matches? How do you aggregate? Don't worry about that for now. It's not, it's not super important for today's purposes. But the idea is that if you had text at the bottom, like a mesmerizing portrait of an engineer, you'd get a score of 2.2. The most fascinating portrait of students would get a score of 1.5. But something like a clear-eyed picture of the modern that would fail because you have to have portrait here, picture 
picture is implicitly a zero. Or flat misguided comedy would be a zero on this pattern. All right, so this is sort of like, it fires and, and it gives you a score if it matches and if it doesn't match, it just has nothing to say. Okay, so this is all kind of old. We could have done this a long time ago. The innovation in, in the soft patterns work was to take something like this and instead of simply listing words with weights on each edge, we're gonna move, we're, it's, it's 2019. How do we, what are words in NLP today? Words are always vectors. So what we wanna do is look at a vector and score a vector. And we have really great straightforward ways of doing that. So here's a, here's a, a simple way to score a word vector. You take the word vector, you multiply it by a parameter vector and add a bias term. And we have a particular weight vector for each arc between each pair of states in our machine and a particular bias parameter as well. And then you, you, you pass that, you pass your weight vector into this linear function, you take a sigmoid, and now you get a score between zero and one. And so now you can score any word on this arc. And what's interesting here is uh, that I think is, is kind, of, uh, kind of cool. You can kind of think of this as being like a prototype word Right? If, if, if you take the inner product of this and a word vector and it's very high, that means it's probably close. So maybe this vector is itself like really close to some particular word. And then the bias vector, the, sorry, the bias scalar can, can, can basically say how open-minded am I about matching things that are closer or farther away from this particular prototype. Right? So you can make this really precise by picking a particular word and then making the bias like large and negative. Right? Okay, so, and you can plug in whatever, whatever word embeddings you want. Of course, you could, you could learn the whole thing end to end. You could use glove vectors or BERT, whatever, whatever you like. It's your, your choice, just the same as everything else in NLP. Um, so when we were doing this work, we really didn't want a completely open-ended finite state machine, though. We had this, this sense that most of the time what you want is essentially a forward chaining machine with a fixed number of states. So it matches, it's sort of matching a sequence of words uh, that goes left to right, and it's of a, of, of a particular max length, and maybe you have self loops on each of the arcs to allow the insertion of some extra words here and there, because you know, maybe sometimes people use punctuation, or they use a two-word adjectival phrase instead of a single word, they insert some intensifiers or something like that. You want the patterns to be a little bit stretchy. So that's what we get, we get this flexible length thing with, uh, with the self loops. But essentially, what, what I want you to see is that the, the parameters only grow with the length of the pattern linearly. So we have parameters for each forward arc, and we have parameters for each self loop, but that's it. You can't transition from any state to any other state. It has a fixed structure. So if I, if I wrote out the transition matrix for this finite state machine, it has a linear number of parameters in the size of the pattern itself. Most of the, most of the transitions are just not allowed. You're going forward or you're staying in the same place. Okay, so we've, we've defined a sort of re restricted class of, uh, uh, of finite state machines and sort of shown how we can think about them as neural nets. Uh, the other kind of cool thing here is that if you want to score an input, like this sequence of, uh, of five words, uh, really all you have to do is take a matrix for each word, which is plugging in the word to each of the transition functions. Uh, to get a value, and then you multiply the matrices together. So the whole calculation of the, the, the score for this input text is a, a series of matrix multiplications, one for each word. And they're very sparse matrices, so it's actually pretty fast. Okay, and then you, you usually have a, a weight vector at the beginning and the end to parameter, to just to sort of signal these are my start states and these are my start states. So the interesting idea here is that this is a recurrent neural net. So so um, this slide is visualizing a, a recurrent neural net that's made out of two soft patterns, just to sort of illustrate that really probably what we're going to want in our model is not just a single pattern. We're going to want a set of them. And all we're going to do is concatenate them. So what's happening here with the, the sort of blue uh, sequence down here is that I'm passing the words in. Uh, I'm calculating a forward score as I go left to right by multiplying together those matrices. And what we've, what we've sort of tried to visualize is how strongly each state matches the pattern, the, the sequence of inputs up to that point. And so what you get here is, is that uh, this is the strongest state uh, in this finite state machine. Here's another smaller uh, uh, soft pattern that only has three states and the strongest matches <coughs> here. And then we can do some kind of pooling at the end by taking the end states out of each of the, the different patterns uh, and get kind of a, a final linear layer to decide how strongly each one matches and how to weight them relative to each other. 
And the, the advantage of setting it up this way, of course, is that now what you have is a recurrent neural net. Everything that I showed you was differentiable. You can train this using the standard technique, backprop, with a standard loss function for your classification problem, and go to town. Okay, but you're using a lot less parameters, and the nonlinearities are really limited just to calculating the transition scores that go into each of these guys here, and maybe something at the top if you want. Does it make sense? Any, any questions? The self loops are, so, so basically when you uh, calculate the, say, take this particular number here, part of that number is what's the score of transitioning from that, from, that, from the same state uh, to itself, right? So, so basically uh, to get this vector, I'm taking a multiply with that vector and the diagonal of the transition matrix, those are the self loops. So, so another way to say it is that each dimension in the hidden state vector at each time step is the same as a forward score in, a, in the forward algorithm or the Viterbi algorithm. Can you really consider this as a stochastic system then? Like you uh, no, there's no probabilistic story here. So, the transition matrix is not. Yeah, so, so, so um, interesting sort of twist. So you can think of weighted finite state machines. Some weighted finite state machines are probabilistic. And you can say these de this defines a probability distribution over paths or maybe over inputs and outputs together. Um, we're not putting that probabilistic semantics on. These are just weights. And so all we're doing is mapping input sequences of vectors to, to scores. But it's not really a transition matrix. It's, it, it, it's a transition matrix. It's just that you're not saying that there's a probabilistic move from state to state. The transitions aren't, aren't uh, stochastic. They're just scored. It's more, more of a declarative way of talking about it. If you wanted to normalize things, you could make it into a probability distribution. Okay, so um, experiments. I told you this was gonna be uh, a, a, an empirical talk. So we, what we did was we built, um, we built the model. We put uh, 200 patterns in uh, with varying numbers of states from two to six. Um, and what you're doing when you, when you run the recurrent neural net is you're, you're feeding in the input to all 200 patterns in parallel, but there's no interaction among the patterns except at the end when you combine them to get a final score. Um, and then there's a little, there's a little multi-layer perceptron at the end, and so we're training the whole thing end to end. Uh, we tested this on three different data sets. Uh, one of them is a fairly large product review data set, uh, sentiment analysis. The second one is the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank, which is movie reviews. The third one is derived from the Rock Stories corpus. Uh, it's a slightly uh, unusual use of that corpus. It's a very small data set of only 3,000 examples. And the idea is that you're, it, it, we, we are essentially treating it as a, as a kind of style classification. So you get a sentence and you're deciding, is this a, a, a proper ending to a story or is it a, a fantasized uh, wrong ending to a story? Uh, as, as Turkers were prompted to write good and bad endings to stories, but we're actually not looking at the story prefix. Um, so it's kind of a, we have an earlier paper that, that argues why this, uh, this data set is broken and we're sort of using that to give, that to give us a, a new task. Uh, we compared with a whole bunch of, uh, of earlier methods. One is hard patterns learned using a, a symbolic learning technique with logistic regression, a CNN, a deep averaging network, and a bi LSTM. Um, if I were giving a slightly different talk, I'd have a lot to say about hyperparameters, but I'm not giving that talk today. Uh, what we like to do for hyperparameters is random search, and all the details of the random search are given in the paper. I'm not gonna talk about that now, but, but we, we tried to be fair in comparing the methods when we ran the random search. But you have to keep in mind that it's, it's challenging to do that because each of these different methods, including ours, has sort of different hyperparameter choices you can make. And so being fair is, is maybe not a perfectly well-defined idea. So I, I just want to like state that and, and point that that's, that's true sort of universally across NLP right now. Um, in any case, after training each of these models, um, we were really interested in whether SOPA could get you better performance with fewer parameters. So what you're looking at here is accuracy on the x-axis. And as you move down, you're getting exponentially more parameters in your model. So ideally, we want to be like up here, right? High accuracy, small model. Uh, on each of the data sets, we found that SOPA was competitive 
uh, with the best model, and on the two smaller ones, it's ac it actually was better than than uh, the other be the other the, the next strongest model. On Amazon, it's close, but it's slightly worse. Uh, but it's always using less parameters than the BiLSTM. Okay, so uh, I, I, I don't know if people find this convincing or not, but um, using an order of magnitude less parameters and getting better performance seems like a real win in my mind. Uh, I'm not sure these numbers are state of the art anymore. I think people have done a lot of, uh, a lot of work on these data sets, um, but that wasn't really the point. The goal was to show that you know, with similar amounts of hyperparameter tuning, you're getting, uh, you're getting stronger performance in a couple of dimensions. Um, I also think it's useful uh, to look at learning curves because in a lot of real world cases, people don't have massive amounts of data. So this is the Amazon data where we did have a lot of data and we, did, we could do experiments with less training examples. Uh, and so here we're, we're backing down from the, the, full, the full data set of like 20,000 down to like 100 examples. And what we find is that SOPA dominates as you move to 1,000 or fewer training examples. So that's, uh, I think, also good news. If you can get the same accuracy with less data, a lot of people are going to pay attention. Um, there's a few more interesting twists in the paper that I don't have time for today. So we incorporated epsilon transitions into the finite state machines. Uh, we have a version that uses a max instead of, a, uh, instead of an addition operation. And that essentially means you're doing a max match, like a Viterbi algorithm. And if you take away some of these things, like self loops and epsilon transitions and the sigmoid, then uh, you can show that SOPA basically reverts back to being a convolutional neural net that's looking at fixed length patterns of the input. So this, so I think the, the title of the paper actually said something like bridging CNNs and RNNs because you can kind of use SOPA as a kind of RNN that can also simulate a CNN. Kind of useful because C CNNs are attractive, right? They're really, really fast. Um, should we, is it, should I talk for a bit more? Do you have like a switching topics now? Um, I, I have like three slides kind of visualizing the patterns and then a switch. Okay, so, so here's, here's what I really love about this model. If, apart from the fact that it works with less data and it's smaller, you can very easily see what it's doing. So, so here what we're doing is we're taking uh, a particular input. These are actual examples uh, from the Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. And what we have done is, is found the max match for some of the patterns uh, in the data. And these are negative patterns, just to kind of, well, I'll show you positive ones in a second. So you get uh, what the kinds of patterns we're learning are, uh, again, they're not exactly these words, right? Because they're actually soft. They're, they're, they're parameterized by word vector-like things uh, in a sequence. But they're matching things like it's dumb, it's just not scary too predictable, too self-conscious to reach a uh, something, opaque story, hippies, hippies are negative. <laughs> hippies are bad, nobody likes movies with hippies. Um, the positive patterns on these uh, are sometimes a little bit more discoursey, like, but more importantly, but you've got acclaimed actors and actresses, potentially moving, high drama, careful pace, soaringly, transparently moving. That might be the same, that's probably the same pattern as this one, I would guess, uh, is inspiring, especially for Interestingly, these aren't always like well-formed syntactic constituents. They're just sort of styles of language that seem to correlate. Um, another thing you can do is you can, you can say, all right, here's a pattern. Give me the, the strongest matches in the training data for this pattern. And so that's how I extracted out that mesmerizing portrait pattern from before. And down at the bottom, I've drawn the, the, the states that are matched. Sometimes the self loops get used. So here's a, here's a negative one. Uh, sorry, no, this is also a positive one. Honest. Uh, sort of a list with an optional second, uh, second word, um, honest, uh, soulful, scathing, and joyous, I don't know, uh, negative one, dull, and other words that are also kind of negative with an adverb in the middle. Um, so I, I don't know, I really like this uh, because I can see kind of what the model's doing. It's learning, it's learning patterns that make sense to me and it speaks, it speaks my language. Um, so to, to summarize so far, I've introduced soft patterns, SOPA, which is uh, an RNN that formally equates to a stack of WFSAs that are scoring sequences of word vectors, calculates them in parallel, works well uh, for text classification tasks, and particularly uh, with fewer parameters and, and less training data. Uh, and so my, my take home from this, what got me excited after we finished this project was that this discovery, RNNs don't have to be completely inscrutable and disrespectful of theory like these uh, people who live with me um, 
which are always inscrutable and disrespectful of theory. Uh, so you can download the code, you can play with it. Maybe, you, you'll, maybe you'll do that instead of getting pizza, but let's, let's break and get pizza and then we'll, we'll come back and I'll keep going. Okay, should we, should we pick up again? Okay. So, um, so, uh, so we introduced these soft patterns and, um, and this got me really excited for reasons I already explained. And then we stepped back and said, you know, maybe there's a more general kind of thing here that's worth thinking about. And so, um, so we, we sort of designed uh, the soft patterns around, so we carefully designed those finite state machines around the particular problem we wanted to solve and the kinds of methods that had worked in the past. But then, you know, we had this sort of deeper, more formal question, um, what does it mean to build a, a, uh, a, a recurrent neural network out of a finite state machine? And so we, we, so essentially stated what we wanted. We said, we're gonna call them rational recurrences and, and that's not because we think that they have rational power um, in, in the way we use rational in day-to-day -day life. It's, it, this is a technical standard term for, uh, for things that have a connection to weighted finite state machines. So you've heard of um, uh, rational series and rational kernels and so on. So we, we dubbed them rational recurrences and a recurrent network is, na is rational if its hidden state can be calculated using an array of one or more weighted FSAs over some semi-ring. And then we added this sort of extra constraint that we want the operations to take constant time and space uh, just to keep things efficient. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into that in detail. Um, and we started looking at some recently proposed uh, recurrent neural networks. So in 2017, 2018, there were a lot of new papers about, uh, about new networks that were maybe faster than LSTMs or simpler or maybe easier to understand. And we started looking at them. Uh, so this is one from Lay et al. 2017. It's called the Simple Recurrent Unit. And it didn't take a lot of work to figure out that we could write it down as a finite state machine. And so, so it's, it's got two states um, for, uh, and, and you know, many of these, many instances of this, if you stack it up together. Uh, but if you just think about a, a single, um, uh, a, a single very small uh, two-state, two, you know, dimensionality two recurrent neural net. This is what it looks like. It's weighting the first self loop with a one. It's got a, a weird function for the transition, and then it's using reusing part of that function in the in the final state. Um, and so you can think about what a simple recurrent unit is doing is it's take, if you take its dimensionality k, divide it by two, it's that many of this kind of machine, each with their own parameters and it's matching all of them at the same time. So that's kind, of, that's kind of amazing, and then we kept looking and we discovered there's a whole bunch of these things. So uh, a ton of people had published versions of recurrent neural nets that without, without thinking about finite state machines, they were actually all finite state machines. So I'm not gonna go through these in detail because it's a little tedious, but in the paper we carefully go through and show how each of these different models we can just do uh, a stack of weighted finite state machines. So rational recurrences were already every there. We, we, we are not claiming to have invented them. We're just claiming to have given them a name. Um, and so this, this is kind of cool because um, uh, there's a reduction from this, these models that, that have generated a lot of interest. I think the, the QRNN is maybe the one that's uh, gotten the most use recently. Um, and, and old, you know, formal language theory that, um, that uh, people, people remember from an earlier time. Um, and so you can kind of draw this, uh, this Venn diagram and say weighted finite state machines slash rational recurrences live as a subset of, of all the functions that map strings to real vectors and convnets are in there too. And then there's this other set of things that we think are probably outside that set. So we think we're pretty sure Elman networks, LSTMs, GRUs are outside, are not rational. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, like I'm not trying to say something negative about them. I'm, it's just, you know, they don't fit this class. You can't reduce them to a finite state machine. Kind of interesting. Um, we're actually not 100% sure about this. Uh, one of my new collaborators at AI2, Will Merrill, and, and his collaborator in Israel, Gail Weiss, are, are actually working on a proof that LSTMs are not rational. We're, I, I think we're close. So watch this space. Hopefully we'll have more to say soon. Once you've sort of identified this class, then you can start thinking about designing a finite state machine first and then building your recurrent neural network from it. So, uh, so we turn to, to, to the problem of language modeling, uh, which uh, traditionally up until, up until the rise of, recur of uh, recurrent neural net language models uh, about, I don't know, 2010 or so, 
uh, was done with, with uh, essentially finite state machines or finite state methods. We had these things called unigram and bigram models that looked only at the preceding one or two words or three words maybe for a longer model. And, uh, and you, you, you learned these statistics that were very word specific. Um, the thinking was that we could build a language model that, that was essentially a unigram or bigram, but instead of matching particular words to particular parameters, it's going to have little functions kind of like we had in SOPA that match words in the, the preceding or, or two back positions. So here's a unigram model, here's a bigram model. You can decide how many, uh, how many dimensions you're going to have. Um, and, uh, and essentially, now you've got uh, a way to build a language model that still ties back to those old unigram and bigram things. It's going to be very fast, um, and it's close to an SRU or, or some of these other things. So the, the relationship between this new model and some of the older ones is fleshed out in the paper, but it's quite simple. You can see uh, we've basically got a matching function for progressing forward, so this is matching your single word, and then this is matching whatever comes after. And this is matching the first word in your bigram, this is matching the second, and there's some room for having a self-loop uh, in the middle and inserting some words in the middle. So maybe it's a little bit more than a bigram. And like you can do with any language model, you can interpolate. So this was, the, this was kind of the interesting model where we share parameters, we allow you to skip the first word, so now you can, you can kind of consider a very local predictor of, of what comes next and a slightly longer one and interpolate the two. Um, and so this is a very, very... Uh, straightforward, simple model that lives between the new recurrent things and the old Markovian things. Um, so we tested it out on language modeling. We also used it for text classification, and we compared it to a very strong LSTM that had been reported. Uh, we follow their hyperparameters. We do random search for hours, see the details in the appendix. And what we found uh, is, uh, so we're matching, uh, in the 24 million parameter experiments, we're matching the number of parameters in the LSTM. So with the same number of parameters, we can get uh, lower perplexity. Uh, the best of these is the, the interpolated model. Um, the bigram is maybe doing a little bit of overfitting, but together we do better than, than the single unigram. And then we also did an experiment with a, a smaller model that only has 10 million parameters and found that even that is better than the LSTM. So better perplexity with less than half the parameters. Very good news. So no. Yeah. So in SLU, when we did these experiments, we were we we found basically that uh, yes, we have we can uh, we have much faster networks, but we need more layers to yeah. actually get a similar performance. Yep. Uh, it's still much faster because of different things. But yeah. Is it the same here? Do you actually need more layers? Yeah. So so it's a great question. So um, all the things I've said about rational recurrences have been about single layer networks. But of course, when we go to do the experiments, you've got to try it with more layers, and more layers are better. Um, I'm not even showing the single layer experiments. I don't remember how they turned out. I think it's in the paper. Um, but but I, it's, it's arguable that, well, I think it's actually pretty clear that when you have multiple layers, it's not rational anymore. So I had this initial notion when we started doing this work that the layers were going to correspond to like composition between different machines. It doesn't, that, that doesn't work. That was, that was wrong, pretty quickly shown to be wrong. Um, so I'm not sure what you call a multi-layer network where the different layers are rational, um, but I don't think it's rational. It's irrational. It's irrational. irrational. <laughs> I don't know. What, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's an interesting class uh, on its own. Um, arguably, each layer is doing something interesting that you can, that you can maybe interpret, but I, full disclosure, we don't have any theory for what's going on when we go to multiple layers yet. Yeah. How does the tension-based model fit into this talk? Is it, are they irrational? How does which one? Attention models are transformed. Oh, I don't think attention, I, I think attention is like principle free. It doesn't, there's no theory at all. Everything can see everything else. I think they're completely not rational. Okay. Yeah, I, attention models really freak me out. <laughs> um, we also tested it on text classification. I'm just giving a summary by averaging across uh, several different data sets, and uh, again, we see that the, the interpolated model uh, gets higher, consistently higher accuracy uh, than, than the others, and all of them are beating the LSTM. Um, uh, so, uh, so the, the, the sort of, without going into the details, and I think a lot of the interesting things in this paper are really in the, uh, the derivations that show how the different examples of, uh, of um, recurrences derived by others are rational. Uh, I, I don't think that makes for great material in our talk, um, but the, the finding is that many RNNs are actually actually doing finite state matching, um, and 
you know, I think people tend to, tend to forget this idea that um, when you put on a straitjacket and you reduce the capacity or the expressive power of your model, that can actually be a good thing if the constraints that you're imposing actually match reality. And it's been known for a long time that, that to a large degree, language does have Markovian properties. That's why, uh, that's why Ngram models were so powerful and the best thing for so, so long. Um, and so I, you know, I like to encourage people to think about what are the constraints you can impose on your model? Because yes, it's very exciting to have a really big model that can fit all kinds of functions. But um, when you have less data, you're probably going to need something that is more restricted if you want to learn. Um, again, uh, as, as you have led me to point out already, the theory is all about one layer RNNs. In practice, using two or more layers works better. There's more to be done here. We, I want to understand what's going on in the multi-layer case as well. Um, so please help us. Um, codes available. Questions? This is another good breaking point. Yeah. Have you tested this kind of model against adversarial examples? Um, interesting question. Or do you have a particular kind of adversary in mind? Um, so something like in the QA applications, like adding the sentence at the end, well, with that strong hinting works, usually kind of break out the models. I yeah. If this kind of constraint would help in those cases. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I haven't seen a lot of uh, exploration of adversaries for text classification problems or language modeling, which is really what we focus on. <coughs> um, but um, it, I, yeah, I really don't know. Um, I, I, my suspicion is that um, from other work that we've done, analyzing models with attention, uh, one of the things we found is that um, in text classification, and this isn't too surprising, but in a lot of text classification problems, there's a lot of cues from across the whole text that add up to help you make your decision. Even when you use attention and you're supposedly just, you're downweighting a lot of things and paying, and, and paying attention to only a few things in the, in, the, in the input, it seems like there's always a lot more signal there to help you get to the right decision. There's a lot of redundancy in the input. And so I suspect adversarial examples would be harder to come up with in text classification. But I'm not, I'm not sure, and that's not an area I've followed closely. So I could, I could easily be wrong. It really probably depends on exactly what problem you're looking at. But in sentiment analysis, like, people seem to say the same thing lots of different ways in longer reviews. OK. Um, so one of the things that annoyed me about, uh, about those early projects, in the original experiment, I, I kind of glossed over this. Um, we had 200 patterns, and each one had two to six states. And so we had, I, I forget how we divvied them up, but it was roughly, roughly equal proportions or maybe a, a, you know, a fewer of the, of the larger model, larger patterns. But like, where, how do you come up with this? How do you know how many patterns you should use and, and how big they should each be? And you, know, you shouldn't have to think about this. You, shouldn't have to, you certainly don't want to search over it and make it another hyperparameter. So the, the main idea that we wanted to pursue next was to automate the discovery of how many states you need in each pattern. So basically, you want, you want flexibility in the pattern size and maybe, maybe use the smallest patterns you can get away with uh, while still getting accuracy. And so the goal here is to learn smaller, more compact models. And there's a really elegant way to, there was a really elegant way to do this uh, back in the old days when we used linear models. Uh, through sparsity. And I think you've, you've probably heard this term um, sparsity recently because there's been a lot of papers and a lot of excitement around sparse networks, right, where a lot of the weights go to zero or a lot of the connections get zeroed out. And this is, this is, there's been a number of Fluria papers about this just very recently. This is a little different because the sparsity we want here is actually in the number of states in our finite state machine. We want a smaller number of states. We want, some, we want to basically prune away states we don't need. So there's a level of interpretability here that I think is, is um, more exciting than just having a lot of zeros in your neural net. But the idea, the principle is kind of the same. So the way we would do this in linear models was uh, usually a technique called the lasso. And, and the lasso was essentially just another term. So these are, you have a linear model, you have a weight for each of your features, uh, and you'd penalize the, the absolute value of each weight. So you'd, you'd set up your loss function, and then you'd add this term to your overall objective function. And, uh, and then you'd go to town with convex optimization. And there were some special tricks you had to, to use sometimes to get these to go all the way to zero. But what typically happens is when you penalize all the weights in your model with, uh, with their absolute values, many of them will be driven all the way to zero and essentially be taken out of the model. 
And if you make the weight zero, that feature, you might as well not even calculate that feature. So this was seen as a way to maybe get efficiency and maybe get a more compact, more interpretable, simpler model. I think the original uh, paper that did this in NLP was Kazama and Suji 2003. Um, to get some intuition as to why this happens, uh, I really like this picture. You, you sort of imagine that you're, so, so back in these times, the loss function was convex. So what you were doing was you were searching for a minimum of some function. So this is a two weight model, very, very small model with only two weights. And this is my loss function. And so that's the global minimum. And anywhere I start, if I follow the gradient, I'm gonna land on that global minimum. What you're doing when you add this L1 penalty, you're, it's equivalent to saying that I want the, the, the minimum of the function, but I have to stay within inside this L1 box, within a particular L1 distance of the origin. Okay, so it, it, an, an L1 box looks like a diamond. These are, these are all the points that are less than L1 distance one or tau from the origin. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking for the minimum of this function that's inside the aqua box. And what, what you find is that if the true minimum is in certain zones, then you'll always map back to one of the corners of the box. Okay, and in higher dimensions, you get like this weird spiky diamond shaped pointy ball kind of thing. And more and more and more of the, the regions where the minimum is likely to be will map onto one of the corners. And a lot of the weights will go to zero. Uh, so that gives you some, some geometric intuition for why this worked there. Of course, we don't know, we don't really know what the loss functions look like with neural nets. Uh, we're just kind of praying that maybe if we apply the same kind of regularization, we could get the same kind of effect. And people have done this. People have used L1 regularization on neural nets to get sparsity. It's one way you can do it. Um, the interesting twist here is, sorry, is there a question? No? Um, the interesting twist here is a generalization of the lasso called the group lasso, where you, you get to decide my features are going to be grouped together. My weights, my parameters of my model are, are in groups. And what I'm trying to do is push each group's L2 norm to zero. So it's an L1 combination of L2 norms. W sub G is group G's sub vector of parameters. And the property that this has is that each group is gonna be pushed, encouraged to go to zero. And if, if I decide that I really need one of the parameters in a particular group, I don't mind having the others. So groups tend to like flock together and either all go to zero or all not go to zero. Um, and so you can think of this as a generalization. If you put every parameter in its own group, this reverts back to the L1 norm. If you put all the parameters into a single group, this is the L2 norm, also known as ridge regression, L2 penalty, related to dropout and, and other things you've seen in neural nets. Um, so if I have some knowledge about how to group my parameters, this can lead me somewhere interesting in terms of uh, a group sparse model. So we used this way back. I, I, have, to, I have to show this picture because this was such a cool result. Back in 2011, uh, we were working on parsing. So these are results on Arabic dependency parsing from uh, my former student, Andre Martinch. And he was looking at different ways of making the model smaller. So this is the number of features in a linear model, also the number of parameters. And this is parsing accuracy. And what he was trying to do was, was push up into the upper left corner. So he wanted smaller models that maintained accuracy. And he used several different methods, including a group lasso, to get, uh, to get these smaller models. And, uh, and the interesting thing here was that we grouped the features by the template that they imposed. So what you used to do in old NLP is you'd write down a feature like um, the part of speech tag of the parent word is noun, and the child word is a verb. And that would probably get a very large negative weight because verbs don't usually attach to nouns. Uh, and, and then you'd instantiate, that would, be, that would be sort of one instance, but the template would be part of speech tag of parent and part of speech tag of child. And you'd instantiate that all possible ways and give each one its own weight. That one's a cheap one, so you probably didn't mind calculating it, but we had a whole lot of other features that were way more expensive to calculate, right? They took a lot more, a lot of the runtime in these old models was generating the features in the first place, not actually running the parser. So, uh, so the idea was to, to penalize feature templates, uh, maybe based on their size or maybe based on the, the computational expense. And the idea would be that you'd throw out whole templates you didn't need for this language. And we were able to throw out a lot for Arabic and throwing out a lot of templates didn't, didn't lose anything in terms of accuracy. In fact, it got a bit better. Anyway, that was where we got the idea. And the, the, the question in this work was to see whether it worked for neural models. But again, it only makes sense to apply something like this if you have 
some intuition about how you might group the parameters. And most neural nets don't really offer you much of that except maybe to think about layers or something like that. So our thinking here is um, the groups are the states. So each state has a set of parameters associated with it. And if you zeroed them out, it's effectively the same as throwing away that state. And so naturally what will happen is the states at the end get thrown out first. Notice that we made a small change and now all the internal, all the intermediate states there are, are final states. So if you, if you killed the transition out of a given final state, then it's fine. You just have a shorter pattern. So here's our procedure. You train the model with group lasso, one group per state. Things look very similar to what they did before. Um, you're still doing backprop. You're, uh, you're still doing the usual training algorithm. It's just that now you have an extra term in your, op in your objective function. Uh, when you're, once you've converged, you eliminate any states whose weights are within epsilon of zero. And then you fine tune the remaining model with just the standard unregularized loss. And that's usually pretty quick. Yeah, go ahead. So why, why make the, so you did uh, the grouping over states, but not over uh, patterns? Um, you effectively are getting it over patterns as well, right? Because if you eliminate all the states, all the states in a pattern, the pattern's gone. Yeah, but you're also going to a situation where you just get a lot of like these like small patterns or something. That's right. But but if that works well, then I'm I'm okay with that, right? What I what I want is smaller and less patterns. I, I can't show you 200 patterns on a slide. Right? And in fact, that's kind of like, if you, when people talk about interpretability, that should be the gold standard. Can you show me the whole model on a slide? <laughs> not the diagram of the model, not the weird little bubbles and lines that we show with neural net. I want to see the model, like the, what does it mean? What is it doing? That's, and I will do that by the end. And you won't love it because it's, it's not actually perfect. But um, anyway, so, so you know, you, you should always be a little bit skeptical and say, do you really need to automate this? What if we tried a few different... Uh, a few different baselines with different numbers of, uh, of patterns. So we did, you know, we did something with like 24 patterns on glove vectors uh, of different lengths or all the same length. And we did uh, versions with BERT where we used fewer patterns because BERT should be doing more of the work for you. You should be able to get by with less. Um, and, uh, and so these are, these are my 10 baselines. But essentially what you're going to see is plots like what I showed before where I'm looking at accuracy on uh, on, on, sorry, on the y-axis and on the, on the x-axis, we'll have the size of the model uh, in terms of the number of, um, of transitions, which is linear in the number of parameters. Um, so these are four different uh, uh, classification problems. Uh, the top ones are all using glove. And what we see in, in most cases, orange is our method, we're able to do uh, better with, with fewer uh, transitions, with smaller models. Uh, the bird example is on the kitchen data set, and that one is, is fairly striking. We're gaining one and a half points maybe uh, with, a, with a much smaller model uh, than, than like sort of making a crisp decision at the beginning about how many states I'm going to have. Um, this is a visualization of a single four pattern model. This is the whole model. Um, I'm showing it to you by finding the strongest matches and the weakest matches for each pattern. So some of these are, are, are actually pretty clear. So excellent, you know, perfect recommend, product recommend. These are like very positive things and then, you know, very disappointing, was defective, would not. Um, so this is, a, this is sort of, the pattern has sort of a positive extreme and a negative extreme. These are the strongest positive and negative matches. Uh, this one kind of works in the other way. Uh, so the, the strong matches are, are actually mostly negative sentiment, like mine broke, it's something heat, does heat, and then down here something about cold, evenly withstand heat, sturdy cooks, these are probably good things. This one didn't make any sense to me, except maybe the negative end, like useless equipment would not, negative things. Uh, mysteriously jammed apparently comes out a lot. The last pattern is the mysteriously jammed pattern. Um, maybe not the best visual. Maybe you need to see more, uh, more of the words or more matches for these to make sense. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe it's completely inscrutable. I'm not sure. Um, but the fact that we're getting 92% accuracy against a strong baseline with just four patterns, it kind of gives me some hope that maybe we can, maybe we can build models that are not uh, completely inscrutable. Any questions? 
Yeah. So when you generate this patterns, do you retrieve the short um, patterns from the data set and see what's the match score? Um, yeah, so what we're doing is we're, we're finding all the matches of these patterns in the data and then showing the ones with the highest positive and the highest negative scores. So they, they must appear in the training set. Yeah, these are all from the training data. <laughs> uh, it's possible that we pulled these out of the validation data, but I'm, it's, it's one of the two. So have we, uh, is it possible to try that searching through all the word combinations that, that can maximize the score of the pattern? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yes, of yes. course, you, you could do that. Would that make sense? Uh, it would make sense. It, it certainly makes sense. Um, the interesting thing is that I think, so um, conjecture, you might be able to do it very locally by just finding the strongest match for each transition. Right. Um, and I think if you did that, it would be, I think we tried that and it was kind of garbled. It, it was like, you know, it, it's, it wasn't a pattern you would ever actually see because the words didn't really fit together. Does so we found this more intuitive than doing that, but you could do it. But, does it, uh, but that looks similar to your adversarial example. What if we use those garbled oh, patterns and insert it into the... <coughs> yeah, um, I'm not sure what would happen, but it sounds interesting. Okay, um, I'll wrap up. So, um, so you know, we knew some stuff back in the pre-neural times that might be useful now, uh, particularly as we get more excited about models that we can understand and, and maybe are more compact or fast. Um, so, this paper's uh, out at EMNLP. It's just been posted on archive. Uh, the code is the code is available. Um, I'm going to close with a few parting shots. Uh, I think more people need to think about interpretability. I think. Uh, partly because NLP is being used by people who are not NLP researchers and those people want to understand what the models are doing and why they make the decisions they do. We really need to think about what, what our models are doing. Um, there's been a lot of uh, excitement around uh, models based on attention lately and, uh, and, so, and, and I think a lot of people like attention models because you can look at the heat map and say what's being attended to. Um, there's some recent work by uh, Jane and Wallace at, at Northeastern and by my student Sophia Serrano and I uh, suggesting that there's some reason to be cautious about that. I'm not actually sure attention is what we think it is. Um, so I think there's actually a whole line of research on like, are the models even interpretable in the ways we're assuming they're interpretable? So if this, if this is something that, that gets you excited, take a look at this, at this line of work and, um, and, and, and maybe think, I think we need to do more probing to see if the models that we have are interpretable and we need to do more design from the beginning to make models interpretable by design. Um, and I think interpretability also matters because, you know, we all want our models to get better. It's really hard to understand uh, to, to be creative about how to make a model better if you have no idea what it's doing, right? There's no gradient that comes from an accuracy score um, in, in research space. Uh, another point, I made this point earlier, but I like to say it again, um, having constraints uh, may lead to better generalization because you get, uh, you get inductive bias and that's how we learn. Um, and it may lead to tools for getting some analysis that'll give us guarantees. Not today, I didn't give you any guarantees. Uh, I just made this sort of intellectual connection back to finite state machines, but um, I, I'm hopeful that one day we'll be able to prove some things about some of these models. Um, finally, I wanna give a plug for, uh, for an idea uh, that uh, we should be thinking about computational costs for two reasons. One, we're burning a lot of carbon, as, as people have been noting, by doing experiments in NLP. Uh, this position paper by uh, Roy Schwartz and Jesse Dodge and Oren Etzioni and I uh, talks about this and, and puts it in, uh, in very real terms. Um, and you know, this is not just about saving the world as if that weren't enough. Uh, it's also about inclusiveness. So you know, people here work at a university. Um, I, I would be surprised if nobody in the room had ever felt like some concern over whether they can compete in NLP and build things that people want to use with only university level resources. Do you have to work at, at a major tech firm in order to uh, build a model that anybody's going to care about? Hopefully not. And I think by focusing some on efficiency and computational costs and energy footprint, uh, we, can, we can open the door for a greater uh, participation in, uh, in moving the field ahead. Uh, so I will close by thanking my collaborators and sponsors of this work, and hopefully we have some time for questions and discussion.
Um, yeah? Um, thanks for your great talk. And as you uh, said just now, um, your recurrent rational neural network um, just originated from the neural based network and uh, um, inspired by a lot of traditional methods. So I'm just wondering, um, what's your potential next step for such great work? I think it's um, very great to continue this on um, more fields to explore the validity of this. Um, yeah, so I think there's a number of things that could be done. I don't know if we're going to do all of them. Um, my students often have minds of their own about what they want to work on. Um, but if, if I were running the experiments, I would want to test these out in a lot of other settings where RNNs have been useful, like can we do large-scale pre-training with something like this? Is it faster? Is that useful? Is it a good substitute for Elmo or Bert? You know, when we, when we use it in that way. We tested it for a couple of things, but there's a lot more places where neural nets get used. Um, so there's sort of empirical things. And then there's theoretical questions, like, can we prove LSDMs are not rational? I think that's, I, you know, I think going through that process and proving that, which I, I think Will, Will and Gail may have done, um, I'm not totally sure, um, that might lead us to some insight about what's going on with LSTMs. And that might lead to a new model that is rational but also has some of the properties of LSTMs. Like, can we strip away the things we don't need from the things we do? And maybe the dividing line between rational and not is useful there. So I'm always thinking there are new models down the road. I, we have no reason to believe that the models we have right now are the end of the story. Things are changing very fast. So, um, so I, think, I think there's both practical and, and, uh, and theoretical work to be done uh, with these. I'm, I also kind of, you know, part of me would like to get back to um, some of the original projects of computational linguistics, like what are the computational models that best capture natural language syntax and semantics? And we don't think finite, nobody really thought finite state machines were the best way to do that. Um, so finding connections between families of neural models and older symbolic things like, I don't know, CCGs or uh, context-free grammars or, or unification grammar, I don't know. Th that I think would be an interesting direction um, beyond what's been done so far and beyond just like trying to engineer better parsing performance, which I think is critical. Yeah? Um, in your research, I'm guessing there is a lot of uh, you know, desire for rationality as such. So do you think like maybe other applications of a shallow neural network or something could make use of um, the, the stuff you've discovered? Yeah, um, anywhere you use finite state machines, I guess. You could, you could plug these in and see if they work. Um, uh, I, I, there, was a, there was a time when a lot of those methods were also <coughs> getting consideration in computational biology, um, but I'm not an expert in that area, so I would be cautious about venturing. But you know, where you have sequences, this kind of model might make sense. Okay, that's it. Thanks for having me. Thank you.